So if you look up on the big screen, you'll see some examples of our guest artist's work. Eileen Legassi in the center, just to the right of that center table. And she's working with our Museum of Glass Hot Shop team to make her sculpture. The general process for these sculptures, uh, Eileen makes a metal cage. She makes these cages out of recycled silverware. So if you look close, you'll see that it's made combined of spoons and forks. And we're going to blow the glass into these metal cages to form the bodies of the animals. So we're going to make two turtles today, this morning. Yes. Similar, not exactly, but. So uh, just to get you guys started, I'm going to give you just a very brief introduction to how glass blowing works. Everything that we do here starts out in our glass furnaces. The glass furnaces are the machines where you see the doors closed. There's two of them, one on each side of the studio. If you look up on the big screen, you'll see a diagram. That's what the furnaces look like inside. So each one of them has a big ceramic pot. In that ceramic pot is a thousand pounds of melted glass. We keep the melted glass at 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that temperature, the glass has the consistency of honey. If you can imagine a giant crock pot full of honey, that's what the furnace is like. When we want to get the glass out to make stuff. We take one of those steel pipes. Those are called blow pipes. And we dip them into the molten glass like you're dipping into a big jar of honey. We dip it in, twirl it around. A little bit of glass sticks to the end of the pipe. The pipe is hollow, so when you blow, the ball of glass blows up like a balloon. If you want to make something larger, we dip it in, blow a little bubble, let it harden. Then we dip it in a second time or a third time. We just keep building up the glass in layers. All the glass that's in those furnaces is clear glass. It has no color. The orange color that you're seeing is the glow from the heat. So the glass that Sarah just got out of the furnace, that's clear glass. But of course, it's very hot, and it's looking orange. Can we put up the uh, Frit photo? So if you look up on the big screen, one of the ways that we're going to color these things today, we're going to use what's called frit. Frit is just crushed up colored glass. We take the clear glass from the furnace, we roll it in the little chips of colored glass, we put it in the fire, the little chips melt, and it forms a candy coating of color like an M&M. So you see we'll have stainless steel bowls out here. We'll roll the glass in the little chips. Yes, and then knock yourselves out. When we make a sculpture like this, the general procedure is to make the little parts first. So make the flippers, make the uh, you know, arms, whatever, you, the head. We put those all into that silver oven called the garage, keep them warm, then we'll blow the body, then we'll pull the little parts out and stick them on. So right now they're, they're working on the flippers. No, 
well, she builds the, the uh, cage that contains the body, but not the stand and stuff like that. Yeah. We're going to blow a bubble into the cage. It'll fill the cage out. And that will become the body. That will be the body of the turtle. And then we'll take all the little parts that we made, the flippers and stuff, and stick them on. Nope, nope, right now, before your very eyes. Eileen made all the uh, cages before she came here. So if you look in this center, she has the cage for the turtle's body. Does anybody have any questions? How what? Oh, the glass, well, I mean, the glass in the furnace is 2100 degrees, and as soon as it comes out, it starts to drop. Today at 1 o'clock, our guest artist, Eileen Lagasse, is going to give a talk here in the uh, hot shop, and she'll tell you about her career, the multitude of things that she does. She's a welder and a blacksmith. She works with glass, and uh, get a chance to ask her questions. Folks that she's working with are our Museum of Glass Hot Shop team. They're employees of the museum. We have Ben Cobb in the center, Sarah Gilbert over on the far right, and Gabe Feenan over on the left. And these guys all work for the museum. They're all incredibly skilled glass blowers. They each have at least 20 years experience making glass. We also have two other folks. We have Carly, our intern, and Tim, who came with Eileen. round ovens that you see with the doors open, those are called the glory holes. The glory holes have no glass in them. They're just a hot chamber for heating and softening the glass while we're working. The glass only stays hot and soft a little while while we're working. So we do whatever shaping we can while it's hot and soft, and then we return to the glory hole and heat it up again.
Yeah, we, 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 we're going to, uh, we have a pattern sort of put together like a little jigsaw puzzle for the shell, and we're preheating it in that oven over there. Oh, we put them together. Could we put up the, uh, picking up the Marini slide? See if we, the one that has everything on it. No? How about Marini chop chop? Oh, there it is. Okay. So uh, we do, we're using what's called Marini. The little chips of glass that we use like a kind of mosaic tile. So we make a rod that has all the colors, all the pattern going all the way through it, and then we chop off little pieces, and you can see in the upper left-hand corner, and we use each of those like a little mosaic tile. We lay out our, our pattern on a ceramic plate, heat it up, and then we pick up that mosaic pattern. So, the, those are called Marini, and that is a technique that dates back to the first, second century AD. So it's very old.
we put up the Marini compare slide? So here's two Marini pieces. The, uh, on the left, that bowl is a Roman bowl, first century, second century AD. On the right is a modern sculpture in the from the 90s by Richard Marquis. So that they're both all they're both Marini. So we're it's, we're using it in modern sculptures, but it's a technique that's very very old. Now we have some more Marini on that plate. It's a ceramic plate. We'll give it a little squeeze so that all the individual little tiles stick together. So we heat it up in the oven until it's a little bit soft. And when it's soft, it also gets a little bit sticky. So the trick with these is we want to get them hot enough so that we can make all the devil tiles stick to each other, but we don't want to get them too hot so they don't stick to the plate underneath. If we get it too hot, they'll stick to that ceramic plate. Coated that ceramic plate with a clay-rich mud, and that acts as a release, but it's not perfect. So if we get it too hot, the mosaic tiles will stick. Once in a while, the steel pipes get hot. When they do, we take them over to that trough. It's called the pipe cooler. We lay the steel pipe in the metal trough. We spray water on it. That cools it down, makes it easier to hold. How are you guys? Good. Do you guys have any questions?
going to pick up our Marini pattern. Ben has prepared a, a punty, a little glass on the end. Hot glass sticks to hot glass. So now we have our pattern, and Ben, tall guy in the black shirt, is going to shape that into one of the flippers for the turtle. So we're making all the little parts first, replacing them in that silver oven with the curved side. That's called the garage. We call it the garage because that's where we park stuff until we're ready to use it. It operates at half the temperature of the furnaces. It's hot enough to keep the glass from breaking, but it's not hot enough to make the glass soft. So whatever goes in there stays warm, holds its shape. We're ready to use it. We'll pull it out, heat it up a little extra. you guys have any questions for Eileen, the artist? Most museums you go to, all the artists are dead. Here, we got a live one here. You can ask her questions. center. Ben is taking some measurements off the artist's drawing.
in the man walking across the studio. He's got it preparing the glass for the turtle's head. Head. So Gabe is putting our pattern for the turtle shell into an electric kiln over here. Going to keep that warm. And then we're going to pick it up later on the bubble that we use for the turtle's body. Heating up another Marini pattern. If you came in a little later, we're we have a guest artist, Eileen Lagasse. She's a woman over by the round furnace on the far left. Glass blowing is a team sport. We always do it in teams. So the other people on the floor are our Museum of Glass Hot Shop team, 
And when we have a guest artist, our team uh, assists them. Making a sculpture, not exactly, but similar to this that you see here. Right now we're working on all the little parts, the head, the fins, we'll place them in the garage, then we'll blow the body and we'll stick the little parts on. in there in blue and it fills out the metal frame. You see the little ends of the plumes and stuff? Yeah, so that's all recycled silver. Can we put up some of Eileen's work up on the big screen? Eileen Lagasse is our guest artist. Up on the big screen, you'll see some examples of her work. We actually have some of her work in the gift shop that's for sale. She's a welder, a sculptor, a painter, and she also makes these sculptures where she combines metal and glass. She likes to use recycled metal. So a lot of these frameworks that the glass is blown into are made from old silverware. So if you look closely, you'll see the forks and spoons and all the other parts that she used to construct. Over on your left, Tim and Eileen are working on the head. In the center, Ben, sitting at the workbench, is making one of the flippers. Anybody got any questions? The glass itself is made out of three things, sand, soda ash, and lime. Sand is the bulk of it. Glass is mostly melted sand. The soda ash is sodium carbonate. It lowers the melting temperature of the sand, and the lime is calcium carbonate, and that stabilizes the mixture chemically. We throw those three ingredients into the furnace, cook them overnight at 2,400 degrees. In the morning, we have a tank full of glass. That glass will be clear glass. If we wanted to make it colored, then we add some kind of metal. Different metals make different colors. So if we cook those ingredients up with cobalt, we get blue. Tin, we get white. A little bit of gold, we get red. So the chemistry of glass colors is not quite as straightforward as paint. Paint, you make blue paint with something blue. In glass, there's a bunch of chemical reactions, so you can get some unexpected colors from different uh, mi minerals. If we cook up a glass with copper, if we cook it one way, it turns turquoise blue. 
If we cook it a different way, it turns blood red. The same cup. All the colored glass that we use here at the museum, we buy it from two companies in Germany. And they have, I don't know, over 150 different colors. If you look up on the big screen, you get a nice view of Eileen sculpting the head of the turtle. So now in the center, Gabe is getting ready. He's blowing a bubble of clear glass. Carly in the center with the jeans and black shirt. She's heating up a bar of colored glass. And we're going to coat that clear bubble with the colored glass. So all the glass that's in the furnaces is clear. When we want to make something that's colored, we blow a bubble of clear glass from the big furnace, and then we coat it with colored glass. look over on the left or up at the screen, you can see Eileen, our guest artist, Eileen Legassi. And she's doing what's called cane drawing. She's drawing in some details, I think the eyes of the turtle. She's got a stick of colored glass in one hand, a torch in the other, and she's melting on the little details.
All the colors that you see while we're working are distorted by the heat. So in the center bench, we're coating the bubble for the turtle's body. Carly standing up has, I think it's some kind of white glass. Gabe sitting down has a bubble with clear glass. And we'll coat Gabe's bubble with the white glass. This is called a color overlay. And it's how we color a lot of the things, probably majority, majority of the things that we make here. In a big factory, where you're going to make everything the same color, then they'll melt the colored glass in the big furnace. They'll fill it up with blue. They'll make 100 blue things. Here, we want more flexibility with color. So we start everything with clear glass and then we coat it with whatever color we want. And that way we can have any color we want any time we want. We can coat it with blue, red, green. If we filled the furnace up with, with blue glass, we could only make blue things. Gabe will roll the glass on that steel table and push the white glass backwards towards the pipe until it entirely coats the original bubble. Why is the building shaped like this? There are three reasons. Reason number one, most important one, it looks really cool. That's the big one right there. Reason number two, the building is designed to act like a giant chimney so that there's a natural updraft to take the heat and smoke away from the furnaces. Reason number three is historical. Along this waterway before the museum was here, there were a number of sawmills the sawmills had big metal outbuildings where they burned the waste wood from the sawmills for power. When the architect saw old pictures of this waterway, 
He saw all these cone-shaped buildings, and that's where he got the idea to make the building in this shape. On the left, we have Tim with the turtle's head. In the center, we have Gabe making the beginning of the turtle's body. And in the silver oven with the curved side, we have a bunch of the flippers that we made earlier this morning. Those you made came in a little later. We're making a sculpture similar, but not the same, to this turtle, where we have the glass blown into the steel frame and the glass parts added. Now in the center, Gabe has let his bubble cool and stiffen a bit, and we're going to start to coat it with clear glass. He sticks it into the glass furnace. In the bottom half of that machine is a big ceramic pot with a thousand pounds of melted glass. The glass that he just added is clear glass. The yellow-orange color you're seeing is the glow from the heat. The tool that he's shaping the glass with is called the block. It's made out of wood. It's stored in a bucket of water. As long as the wood is wet, the, it doesn't burn too much, and as long as it, and as long as it's wet, we don't leave any marks on the glass. Anybody have any questions? If you're here with kids, we have a special uh, contest for kids. Any kid that comes to the museum can do a drawing once a month 
We pick one of the drawings and make whatever the kid drew out of glass. We make two copies, one for the kid to keep and one for the museum collection. There's a table, if you want to enter, there's a table in the lobby with all the stuff you need to draw in the entry form. And if you don't feel like drawing right now, grab an entry form, do your drawing at home, and then mail it in. Can we put up some of the uh, kids' design stills? So if you look up on the big screen, these are some of the sculptures we made from the kids' drawings. Any kid 12 and under is eligible. It costs nothing to enter. Just grab an entry form, do a drawing, and hand it in. Our team of glass blowers is extremely skilled, and they're really good at turning the drawings into three-dimensional sculptures. In the center, Ben, Ben Cobb, shaping our bubble using the block. Everything that we make here has to be cooled slowly overnight. So we're pulling out some of the things that we made yesterday. Ben is going over to the pipe cooler. We just lay the steel pipe in that trough, spray water on it. That cools it down, makes it easier to hold.
So in the center, we have our pattern for the shell. So we've cast little hexagons with a pattern in them. We've assembled them like a little jigsaw puzzle. And we're going to adhere that to, the, to Gabe's bubble in the center. And that's going to be the pattern for the shell of the turtle. Given the pattern a little squeeze. When we put it in the fire, the glass gets hot and soft and a little bit sticky. But unless we physically squeeze them together, they won't stick to each other. Anybody have any questions? Do you have any questions, sir? So the trick is to get it hot enough so all those little tiles stick together, but not so hot that it sticks to the ceramic shelf below. pattern that they're warming up is similar to the pattern that you see over here. So Ben's going to roll his bubble over our tile pattern.
So now that we've picked up our tile pattern, we're going to melt it all in. So now Gabe, seated to the left in the light gray shirt, is blowing and inflating the glass as Ben, sitting at the workbench, shakes. This bubble that we have is going to become the body of the turtle. Before Eileen got here, our guest artist, she constructed these uh, metal cages to construct them out of recycled silverware. So they look very uh, elaborate and beautiful, but if you look closely, you'll see their knives and forks and spoons. So this is the cage we're going to use for the bubble. You can see how all these little things, there, the tines of the forks have been flattened and uh, bent into spirals. been like two and a half, three hours.
So Ben's trimming off some of the glass at the end. He's squeezing it with a tool called the jacks. His assistant is holding a wooden paddle in front of his arm to shield him from the heat. The heat that comes off the glass is radiant heat, like an outdoor heater. It heats the first thing it strikes. So if you put the paddle between the arm and the glass, the paddle gets hot and the arm gray pad in Ben's hand that he's shaping the glass with is just folded up ordinary newspaper soaked in water. As long as the newspaper is wet, the paper doesn't burn too much, it doesn't leave any marks as he shapes the glass. When we blow a bubble into a mold, which is essentially what these cages are, we have to pre-shape the bubble. We want to make it somewhat similar to the shape of the mold itself so that when we blow it out, it expands evenly. How long does it take the glass to cool? There's two answers to that question. If we just put it on the table and let it cool on its own, it'd be cool in 20 minutes, but it would shatter. If we want to keep it, we put it in one of these big black ovens and we coo purposely cool it down slowly overnight. We use the glass we cut off. We can recycle the clear waste. We don't have a good way to recycle the colored waste. Now you can see that Ben is flattening the bubble a little bit, so making it more like the body of the uh, turtle and more like the cage, so it's kind of rounded on the bottom and kind of like a kind of 
I don't know, a sandwich shape. Submarine sandwich or something. Anybody got any questions? Yes, sir. No. We can keep keep reheating it forever. It's like wax. When you get it hot, it gets soft. Cold, it gets hard. And we can do that to your heart's content. What's the difference between heating it with the blowtorch and the oven? The blowtorch allows us to focus the heat in a particular place. When we heat it, put it in the red ground oven, the glory hole, it kind of heats it more generally. If we need to focus the heat, we use the torch. So Gabe, seated to the left, he's blown a little bit. And Ben is getting the bubble ready to be blown into the uh, steel cage that our guest artist made. Each time we heat up the glass in the glory hole, the round furnace, only stays soft for a little while. So we do whatever shaping we can while it's hot and soft, and then we have to heat it up again. If you've ever seen anybody work at a forge where they take the metal, put it in the fire, soften it, work on it a little bit, soften it again, it's the same kind of routine here. You burn the glass. You can't burn it, but you can make it boil. So the hotter the glass uh, gets, the, s the thinner it gets, and you can actually get it to boil like water. Here you see the cage we're going to blow into. There you see the bubble that's going inside. Hi, how are you guys? Good. 
How long have they been? You mean today or their whole lives? Let's see. Uh, ben, standing up uh, at the furnace, 29 years. Sarah, I think 23. And Gabe, uh, 26. So Ben's getting ready to drop the bubble into our steel frame. As he blows, the bubble will fill out the steel cage. Give me a hand. Now you get a better idea where we're going. It's starting to look more turtly. Almost everything we do starts out looking nothing like what we're going to end up with.
Can you hear that, that little piece explode? That's why we have to cool the glass uh, slowly when we're done. If we let the glass cool on its own, it can cool too quickly and it creates tension. And as you, you just heard, a little cutoff just blew up on its own. We don't want that to happen to our nice turtle, so we're going to cool it slowly overnight. Next thing we do is, I th is add a tail, I think. Carly brings Ben some glass. Cut it off. And ben will form it a little bit. pre-made some of the, the flippers in the head here in the garage. We're going to start to pull them out one by one and attach them to the body of the turtle. When we attach the parts, we have to do two things. We have to heat up the part itself, and we have to heat up the spot where we're going to attach it. When those two things are hot, if we press the glass together, they'll fuse together. So we want to heat up a spot on the turtle. We want to heat up the edge 
of the flipper we're going to attach and then press the two hot areas together. Here's brought a flipper. Ben's going to pick it up, heat up the edge. We'll attach it. The torch in his hand is a propane and oxygen torch. It has a 5,000 degree flame. It allows us to heat up one small area of the glass very hot very quickly. You can see he's heating the edge of the flipper. He's heating the spot where he wants to attach it. And then pressing the two together.
over on the bench on the far left, Gabe in the light gray shirt is making what's called the punty. We're gonna, it's going to be kind of a temporary handle to hold the turtle from the bottom while we add stuff at the top. There's a special kind of punty. It's called a two-prong punty. So it's going to have two spread out areas of attachment. So we're getting ready to attach the punty, P-U-N-T-Y. Gabe is going to dip the little tips of the punty in molten glass. So the structure of the punty will be cooler and stiffer. And the little tips will be hot and sticky because they have the hot, fresh glass on them. We stick the punty onto the body. We're going to bend it so it's a better angle. We we'll make some little notches in it so we have a place to break it off. Once the punty's all squared away, we'll break the glass away from the original pipe. Drip some water where we want the glass to break. The water will crack that glass. We'll give the pipe a sharp tap, and off it comes. So now the, the top of the turtle, the neck, where the neck would be, that's exposed. That part can now be heated and shaped.
it's almost noon now at 1 o'clock. Our guest artist, Eileen Lagasse, is going to give a talk here in the Hot Shop. And she'll tell you about her career and all the cool stuff she's done and made. And that'll be happening at 1. We're going to clean up that opening. We broke it off the pipe. While we do that, we have to make sure that all the smaller, thinner parts are kept warm so they don't break. 
The thinner something is, the faster it cools. The thicker it is, the longer it holds the heat. Heating an object like this is a very uh, tricky proposition. You want to get it, keep it hot enough so it doesn't crack. You don't want to get it too hot so it starts to lose its shape. And you want to have all thick and thin parts that you've got to uh, equalize. Some of Eileen's pieces are in the gift shop, available for purchase. So now that you see what goes into them, you can really appreciate them all the more. Hi, how are you guys? Good. Good. Do you guys have any questions?
Sarah's coming over with the head of the turtle that we sculpted that earlier this morning. We've been keeping it warm. Now it's time to attach it. You heat up the base of the head. You heat up the spot on the turtle's body where we want to attach it. And then we press the two together and they will fuse. Still have two more flippers to add. Sarah is heating up one of them right now. Sarah over by the left in front of the garage, the silver oven with the curved side. Sarah's heating up the flipper in the glory hole.
Glory Hall is the round furnace with the door open. Heating up the edge of the flipper that's going to go nearest to the body. We're going to heat up a spot on the body where we want to attach it. And we'll press the two together and they will stick to each other. Can we put up the Marini slide, the all-inclusive one? Stop. Keep it up for a minute. Thank you, Chris. Yes, homemade, fresh from the oven.
colors are distorted by the heat. When it cools off, it goes back. If you think about...
to take the piece to the annealer. We're dripping some water on the joint between the sculpture and the metal rod. The water will crack those joints and a sharp tap on the pipe will release it. So let's have a big hand for Eileen Lagasse and the Museum of Glass Hot Shop team. <laughs> and for Sarah. I think we'll probably cool it over 24 hours, something like that. That is an annealing oven. Just different size and shape, but the same machine. Uh, there's a few little things to do. There's a little uh, where we've got to grind and polish the place where it was attached to the punty. And I don't know, then she's got to build a stand for it. Can we play color overlay? The color in glass comes from adding various materials to the mixture of we raw ingredients the called down? batch. Hot, Most of the colorants hot. are compounds containing some kind of That's metal. Good. For example, adding cobalt to clear glass creates a deep blue. Tin and antimony can be used to create white glass, and gold chloride can produce a rich red or pink colored glass. Colored glass is melted in furnaces, just like clear glass, and then is usually rolled into bars for storage and easy application. In order to apply color bar to a bubble, we first need to preheat the color to approximately 950 or 1000 degrees Fahrenheit in a color oven or garage. Once warm, the color is then picked up on the end of a punty rod using a little bit of clear glass as a support. The color is then heated in the 2300 degree glory hole to soften it and make it malleable, while another artist creates a small bubble of clear glass on a blowpipe. Once warm, the color is dropped over the clear bubble, and then using a variety of hand tools or the steel marver, the color is rolled back over the clear in an even layer. This process is called dropping color, or creating a color overlay. Depending on the project, that bubble is then usually gathered over with clear glass and blown into the final form. The finished product may appear to be all made from colored glass, but when viewed in cross-section, we can see that there is only a thin layer of color sandwiched between many layers of clear glass. It's 12.30 now. Uh, at 1 o'clock, we're going to have a talk by our guest artist. Eileen Lagasse, and that'll be here in the hot shop. So we're going to do a little bit of uh, utilitarian stuff until then. 
we have to make what's called a color cup. Uh, when we want to put the, can we put up uh, stuff in a color cup? So if you look up on a big screen, we want to put a layer of color on the outside of an object. We blow what looks like a little colored bowl, and then we drop another bubble inside. It's called stuffing a color cup. So we're going to use a color cup on the next turtle. So we've got to make that now. Does anybody have any questions? If you came in a little later, our guest artist is Eileen Lagasse. She's the woman walking towards us right now. And she's working with our Museum of Glass Hot Shop team of glass blowers. And we're making these sculptures similar to the, the sculpture that you see on that pedestal. It's going to be another turtle. It's going to have the, the metal cage in the, in the center. But I think it's going to be quite a bit more elaborate and larger. Special paint that's made, actually made out of glass. It's made out of very finely crushed clear glass and metal oxide pigment. And you mix it up with oil or water, you paint it onto the glass when it's cold, and you put it in a kiln and you fire it like you fire a pottery. Like melts? Yes. It melts into the surface.
So she's here for uh, five days working with our museum of glass, glass blowers, and she gets to make whatever she wants. And uh, so these are all things, except for the owl, that were all made here while we're working. She made all these metal cages before she came here. Well, we blow the glass into the metal cage, and you see it forms the bodies of these sculptures. And all these cages, are, they're all made out of uh, recycled silverware. So these are a bunch of spoons. She pre-made, before she came here, she pre-made all the metal. And now, now we're blowing glass into it and sculpting all the parts. In about 20 minutes, uh, we're going to have, uh, Eileen's going to give a talk here in the hot shop. So you'll get to learn more in greater detail about what she does.
So we're going to, Sarah in the center has a bubble of clear glass. We're going to drop a big blob of colored glass on top. Snip it off. And Sarah's going to uh, smear it until it entirely coats the original bubble. This is called a color overlay. We put up the color overlay diagram. So if you look up on the big screen, we have a little diagram. So we drop a big blob of color on top of the clear bubble. Then we smear it until it entirely coats the original bubble. And then we'll dip it in more clear glass. And when we blow it up, that colored layer will line the object with color. So it's not the color through and through. It's just basically a lining of colored glass. While the folks at the center bench are making our color cup, Tim over on the far left is starting the glass for the turtle's head. He's rolling the clear glass from the furnace in little chips of colored glass called frit, F-R-I-T, and melting them on. We put up the frit photo. So this is a commercially uh, colored glass. We buy it in, in, these, in this crushed glass form. We roll the clear glass from the furnace in little chips, and then we put it in the fire, melt it on, and it melts and forms a little candy coating of color, like an M&M. The colored part is on the outside. Anybody got any questions? We're, gonna be, we're making a head over there, and we're making a color cup over here. We're going to use to color the body. Make another turtle in a very sort of similar way to the one we made this morning. We have our talk at 1, which is 15 minutes from now. It's in here. Then we'll have the talk, then we'll have a short lunch. And then back to making turtles.
Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, sorry, that was abrupt. Uh, the team and Eileen Lagasse are just finishing up, uh, getting to a stopping point before our artists talk at one. So I'm here if you have any questions, uh, but we're gonna get started with the lecture here in just a couple minutes. So you're just in time. Nice to see you all. Good afternoon again, everybody. Welcome, it's so nice to see such a full house on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. My name is Katie Buckingham, I'm our curator here at Museum of Glass, and I am honored to be here with this week's visiting artist, Eileen Lagasse. Eileen is owner and operator of Quench Bucket Studios, and she comes here through one of the most, uh, let's see, one of the most energetic and exciting campaigns we've ever seen at our Red Hot Annual Auction and Gala. Eileen was awarded People's Choice 
for the piece that she donated to support the museum last year. And from that People's Choice Award uh, came this wonderful residency. Eileen has been here combining her work as a blacksmith and working in steel with our uh, glass in our hot shop. And what I've been really inspired by Eileen is your attention to using reclaimed materials to call attention to recycling and using objects that are in your life in new ways. Uh, but I'm honored to introduce Eileen here for her lecture. Uh, she's gonna tell you a little bit about her work and how uh, she set up her studio and what she's been doing this week. So um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Eileen. Thanks, Katie. Uh, to start off, this is uh, probably a surrealist moment I've ever had. I'm going to be very emotional um, because um, I've been a starving artist for uh, 50 years now. I have been uh, creating art to make people happy to, and, and, and to impress. I had a very lonesome childhood. Um, I was a little bit um, of a loner as a youngster, and so where I spend my time was with music and with art. And uh, when I was a youngster, I was, uh, I was I think it was about 10 years old, my, I, I told my dad that I was bored. And so he said, let's go to the wood store. That's what he called Home Depot, the wood store. So we went to the wood store and we picked out some small containers of paint, like quart sized paint, containers of paint. He says, I'm gonna clear out this wall in, your gra in the garage and you're gonna paint it. You're gonna make, make me something beautiful. And that was sort of the start of how everything sort of evolved in my life. Um, I'm gonna use my notes, sorry. So, uh, I went to college for art. Now, the choice was um, a difficult one for me. When I was uh, young, I was a musician and a singer. I had a head trauma that caused me to have uh, hearing loss and the ability to speak at the time. I've since gotten my speech back. Sorry, since got my speech back but didn't get my hearing. So it was an easy decision to go into art. Um, my brother um, is five years older than me, and before I even got off to college, he was awarded the very first uh, Jim Henson Award. He now works as a puppeteer for the Muppets, and I admired my brother very much, and I wanted to do sort of what my brother did. I wanted to do something similar to that, so I chose animation. So I went to college in Boston. Um, I went to Emanuel College in Boston, and while I was there, um, down the street was Massachusetts College of Art, and they allowed me to sort of um, split my time between the two colleges to build my own very own degree. So my degree is actually in animation. I got a job right out of college working for a company called J.J. Settlemeyer. They're most notorious for um, working on the next generation of schoolhouse rock. Now, if you're anywhere near my age, uh, schoolhouse rock was on ABC, and it was a educational animated features like Conjunction Junction, if you know that, and I am just the bill. I was lucky to work on the second generation of uh, schoolhouse rock, and I got to work on Mr. Morton, and busy prepositions. And I was a cell painter for them. So I got to uh, paint cells for J.J. Sennelmeyer. It was a real honor. And while I was there, I got to meet uh, an, um, a comic named Berkeley Brethren. He's the gentleman that um, invented, or he's the, the illustrator of Opus the Penguin. If you know that, sat sat he's a satire uh, comic. And while I was there, he was really impressed with my cell painting skills and asked me to um, animate in a flip book a video, um, or actually, I animated, I painted every cell in this flip book right here. And he signed it for me, and I still have it. 
This is back in 1996. So it was really, it's an like honor. I mean, I've always loved Opus. It's probably one of my favorite comics. Um, even as a youngster, yeah, build a cat, ak oop. Uh, so um, that was really cool. And then um, the jobs were sort of just kind of shortening up because computers were sort of taking over. And this was sort of, I, I made my, <laughs> my degree on the cusp of computer animation. My college had no idea how to handle computers at that time. They taught me how to traditionally draw and how to traditionally paint and how to use st stop motion animation using uh, Super 8 and six millimeter. This was before the digital age. And so all these jobs were now, oh, this is new technology. We want to use this new technology I had no knowledge of. And so all these jobs were sort of being taken over by computer, computer analysts and computer programmers that didn't have any art background, right? And so I couldn't find a job to save my life. So um, I actually had to um, fall back. So I fell fall back onto my um, my mur mural painting that my dad got me started doing. Um, my mother was a kindergarten teacher at a local Catholic school, and they needed an art teacher. So I said sure. And in the summertime, as you know, most teachers don't get paid. So what I did was I painted the halls of this school to get paid, and so I painted the entire school, which is sadly closed down now, which is really a shame. I have photographs, so it's all counts. Um, but in the, in, during that time, I went back to college to get my master's degree in art education. Let's go back to the time when I was little and I had a head trauma. That head trauma uh, kept me from being able to pass the teacher certification exam. So I couldn't be a teacher because nobody will test will we'll look at my background as a teacher and as a person had developed a curriculum and had used a curriculum and taught teachers how to use that curriculum because they didn't know if I was literate. And I quote. So I had to go into, I had to break down. <laughs> I had to give in to the machine. I had to go back and learn how to use computers. So I started as a, a, a literally a typesetter. I did typesetting. I did, um, I learned how to, to draw a little bit in Illustrator, which is a, an Adobe software. And um, I then got hired as a, as a cartographer making maps. So I could just make the, make the streets follow the lines. And during that time, my, my former partner and I adopted twin, twin boys. That's Brian on top, and that's Shane on the bottom. And Brian and Shane were adopted at age seven. And within a very short period of time, we realized there's no way that we're both gonna have, we're gonna both be able to work and take care of them because they are special needs. They were uh, severely um, behind, malnourished, lead poisoned, all the bad stuff. So they needed someone home with them. Back to murals. I stayed home with my boys for 10 years and raising them, taking them to doctors, taking them to special, special all that stuff. And while they were in school, I painted murals so I can make more money for my family because we couldn't live on one income with these two boys, especially with all their medical needs. So I went back to painting murals. And that's what happened. Computers took that away from me. The large format printer came out in the early 2000s, and that large format printer, someone could paper their room with a photograph that they got at, say, Acadia National Park, which is that top mural right there. And I had it quoted, a photograph, that was done from a photograph. I had it quoted for them to print that out on that wall, which was 30 feet long by eight feet tall, $200. That took me four weeks to make, right? So, once again, I have to digress. I go back. So the kids got older, and I needed to find work. And I had been out of 
out of school for however long, and technology has beat me. It's gone well beyond my knowledge. And so my background as a cartographer got me a job at, you'll never believe it, Sikorsky Aircraft Building Helicopters. I'm not lying to you. I built helicopters, and I worked at Sikorsky Aircraft as a finance person for 10 years. All along, moving on to my next piece. So I, my children were grown. My ex and I grew apart. And then I met my new wife, who's sitting here in the front row, Carrie. And for Christmas one year, we didn't like to buy things for each other. We're very minimalist people. So we like to buy each other experiences. So she bought me a class in blacksmithing at a local like a um, arts like facility. And there was a fellow there who taught me how to, to do traditional blacksmithing. And we went to a fair like the next day and they had a display there, this blacksmithing display. And I got talking with the fellow and he says, I told him, I said, oh yeah, I just took a class. He's like, come on, come on back. Why don't you make something? I'm like, what are you crazy? <laughs> so I came back and I made a bottle opener. And he's like, come to my house every Wednesday. We get together and we just play. And he had like six forges and about 12 different anvils and every tool you can imagine. And this guy taught me everything. He was like 80 years old. And he's still alive to this day. And every year inviting me back to this agricultural fair where I demonstrated my blacksmithing skills. And I got more advanced and more advanced and more advanced. And then I met a guy at the fair who was a welder and he made this really awesome dragon. It was a smoker. So come to find out my wife cleaned his house and I said, hey, can he teach me how to weld? And he's like, come on over, I'll give you a short lesson and then figure it out from there. So that's what I did. I bought a welder. We had a home which had a big, huge garage. It came with a detached, it was now my shop. And I took over and I started welding anything that would come my way. So this is where, this is where the story kind of takes an interesting turn toward what, what comes to, uh, what became a punch bucket studio. So this uh, spider on the bottom there, it's made from a one pound propane tank. Now my wife and I had a grill in our, in our apartment that would use those one little camping size. So I brought it down to the propane guy and I said, hey, can you fill this back up for me? He goes, nah, you can't fill those up. So I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. I said, well, how do I dispose of it? He goes, well, there's no way you can dispose of it. I mean, I said, well, can I recycle it? Nope, you can't do that either. I'm like, so what am I gonna do with this? He's like, I don't know. I had 20 of them. 20. So I happened to be friends with a local firefighter. I went down to the firehouse and I said, how do I get all the fuel out of this? I want to make something out of it. So he brought me to a, a place that was able to drain all the rain or fuel, fuel, safety first. And we made, what was it, like 20 spiders? Something like that. 20 spiders out of these propane tanks and, re and that's how I practiced my welding skills. And then it got my friends, family, other people who bought my sculptures got wind of it. And next thing you know, I'd come home from work every day and there'd be a pile of junk in front of my shop. <laughs> like, oh, I don't need it anymore. I'm not lying to you. This is like, it, it got to the point where I just couldn't move around my shop. There was so much junk. So I had a teacher friend of mine. Um, she used to teach classes at a, um, um, at a gallery, believe it or not. She had kids come in after school, it was an after school program, and she had a bin of flatware. Well, what I thought was flatware, it was actually silver plated silverware. So I'm welding, and I use a MIG welder, and MIG welding, and if you need to, just a little bit of background in metallurgy, you can only put like materials together. Steel, steel, copper, copper, Aluminum, aluminum. There are tricks around it, but I'm not that skilled. 
So I'm trying to weld these spoons to the thing and it won't stick and it's falling off and I've got burns all over me and splattering and this, that and the other thing. So I talked to this fellow that taught me how to weld. He goes, well, that's because you're trying to put silver and steel together. That ain't gonna work. I said, well, how do I do that then? I said, I have these flatware. I wanna really make this, this thing. He goes, well, you need to buy silver to make a two silver stick together. So I go out, I'm like, okay thinking, like a roll of welding wire cost you $11, right? I go out, and there's a rod of silver solder this long, $35. I sucked it up in like two seconds. I had to buy $300 worth of steel, of s silver in order to make this owl right here. His name is Oscar. So I, uh, I had a big garden in my yard, and I wanted to, um, here, let's put it here. I wanted to, uh, to make some characters that, I actually welded a fence that went around, it's a big 30 foot round garden. I welded the fence that went around it and I wanted to put like these characters and weld it to the fence. So I said to one of my gal pals, I said, yeah. She goes, that thing's awesome, I love it. I said, yeah, I'm gonna weld it to the fence. She goes, no, you're not. You're not doing that. I go, why? She said, because someone's gonna, it's, it's gonna fly away is what she said. It's gonna fly away. I said, okay. I guess I won't, so I made a little stand for it and I would take it around to shows. So then I made a, a squirrel out of forks and nuts and ironic things. And I show that to her and say, I'm gonna put this on the fence. She goes, no you're not. That's gonna scurry away. So every time I tried to make something different, apparently it was too good to put out on my own fence. So, I was running out of space in my shop. I got a little out of control. And I was starting to learn a little bit more about metallurgy and how to, uh, to recycle things. Um, and, and I was discovering just how expensive like raw metal was to, to weld. And that expense, where did I put my clicker? I put it down. Oh, here it is. Um, junk metal's free. And if you're a starving artist, you know free is good. So I started to um, narrow my path. Now, I did get commissions to do things like gates and railings and things like that. And I, you know, buying raw material is very important when you do that kind of thing because it looks a lot nicer. However, I started to make these fences and gates like the one you see here and doing all this blacksmithing and all these curls and whatnot. And I make these things and people are like, well, I like the stuff you make out of junk. Well, I guess I can't win. So I started to make things out of junk. This is sheet metal, junk sheet metal I found at the junkyard. This is spoons. These are dental tools. My sister's a dental hygienist and she gives me dental tools like scissors and picks and the little mirrors that you get off that when they can't be sterilized any longer. And right here, I don't know if you, if you're my age, you know, you might know what that is. I took apart a typewriter. And uh, his feet are actually made from the hammers, but you can't see it. So the hammers on the typewriter are his feet and his eyeballs are the keys. And I just try to find a way to, and this is actually from a typewriter as well, right here. Find ways to, to recycle these things. And kind of just really resonated with me, this recycling thing because um, it was such a, I, I grew up on the ocean and um, to see just how people are treating the ocean by, you know, just so many products out there that are unnecessary and not living in within the, the what you need. need the, you, you know, you don't need a lot of stuff. As my dad used to say, what do you need all this stuff for? You don't need stuff. You need what makes you to be able to function along the way. And I had stuff like you wouldn't believe. So I discovered that I could recycle a lot of that stuff. So I recycled a lot of the metal that was given to me. I did not throw it away. I brought it down to the recycle plant. <laughs> that was a big mistake. I went down to the recycle plant and he had all kinds of cool things that I can make stuff out of. And it was like, oh no. So I decided to get, um, you know, to, we, did, we did a little business and I was able to make a bunch of really cool things um, with that fellow. Um, 
the next page is, uh, now mind you, this is all made in Connecticut. That's where I'm from. My wife and I had a house in, um, in Wallingford, Connecticut. We had a big old farmhouse with a big old shop in the back, which was wonderful. And um, my brother-in-law lived here on Whidbey Island and been trying to get his sister out here for however long. And so finally he convinced us and we moved out um, back in 2018. And I, uh, I got a commission to do an octopus lamp. Whoop, wrong button. This octopus lamp right here. See this arm? And it's a clamp to a table and it was a, like a table lamp. You could clamp it to the table. Well, the person who commissioned it from me failed. Didn't want it. So I, now I have this beautiful sculpture and I don't know what to do with that. So I put it in the corner on my workshop bench. And then I started making something different. And I started making this. You can't see it under the closed captioning. It's a squid. Thank you. And I got, uh, I, I found this woman in Olympia that does slump glass, which is basically just taking it, warming it enough so it sags and takes the form to make the fins. I get talking with her and we had a plan and she was gonna buy the glass and this and the other thing and I go to reach out to her again and she passed away from COVID. So I'm like, now what am I gonna do? So I take that and I throw it in the corner, boom. Piled in the corner, all these unfinished projects, which is not like me. I don't like to not leave, well, my wife will tell you otherwise, but I don't like to leave projects unfinished. Um, and I one day walked into my shop and said, what am I gonna do today? And I saw the pile of them in the corner. And I said, huh, it looks like they're kind of in a fight there. And that's what happened. I set them up on my table and I started to put them together. And I ended up with this, what we're calling underwater disagreement. And Olympia has a, a, pro has a uh, contest every year for their, their boardwalk landing. It's called Percival Landing. And they have a contest every year. So I entered. And I got awarded a plinth. There's 18 award, awarded plinths. And they have another thing like we do here at the Museum of Glass. They have a People's Choice in that one, People's Choice Award here in Olympia. So things are looking up. Things are definitely looking up for me. One day, uh, my partner and I were down in Centralia. And we see glass blowing demonstration. I'm like, oh my God, there's glass blowing here. <laughs> Come to find out it's everywhere here. And we went in to, to talk to the fellow that owns the glass shop. And I said, hey, I want to make a steel structure and I want to blow glass into it. Can you do that? He's like, I don't know, maybe. So the first piece I made with him is the skull and it is in the, um, the, the shop. I don't have it on this photo, I apologize for that. And then I said, okay, I'm gonna make this pelican. I will make the steel structure in advance and all we need to do is make the bubble and I really wanna be a part of that and learn how to do that. And so that's where my glass blowing journey started. Almost exactly a year today. We made that, that bubble and then I started making more cages. I'm like, we can do this, I'm gonna keep doing this. Kept making more and more cages. So I kept bringing more cages to him and he's like, you could see he's aggravated. He's like, oh, not this woman again. And he's got a fellow that's working with him. And I said, I wanna fill these fish cages up with glass. And he goes, no, we can't do it. And so he walked away and the apprentice says, yeah, we can. And he said, put it in the annealer. Let's get it all warm and we'll blow some glass into it. And that day we blew this fish and there's a blue one and it's in the shop right now. And the next day, um, I had been talking with the, the, the ladies and, and Shane in the shop here at the museum because I've been trying to find a place where I can display my artwork. And so they said, bring it on down. We'll look at it. I was like, okay. I'm thinking that, you know, they're gonna look at it. They're like, yeah, maybe we'll take one or two. He's like, okay, we'll take it all. Whoop, took it all brought eight pieces down and they took every single one of them. I was like, oh, okay, 
wasn't expecting that. Took every single one of them, and then he told me about the Red Hot and said, hey, listen, if you want to donate a piece, you get a free ticket. I was like, sweet. I can go to a, uh, a I get to get dressed up. I get to, you know, not be in funny clothes and dirt all over my body, and I can put makeup on, and I can do, you know, look fancy. And I know my wife was like, let's do it. So I donated a piece, I got a free ticket, and I got a nice meal, right? I did not know that there was a people's choice option. I was all about the meal and getting dressed up, getting out of the house. So uh, that's, um, that happened. So I'm going to back up a little bit. We talked about the fact that I am deaf, and so I wear hearing aids. I'm about 20% hearing in one side. Over the last five years, I've rapidly lost my hearing. So um, I would come here every day since I brought my stuff, and I would sit in those stands, and I would watch and watch and watch, and I'd open it up on YouTube, and I'd watch and watch and watch, and I was like obsessed trying to find out how they're doing this stuff. And I couldn't, couldn't hear a thing. Even with the, the radio, with the TV cranked, there was no cones captioning. So I talked to the AV team here, and I said, hey, is there any way that you can get like closed captioning on your screen there, or even on your YouTube channel? And I, caught, I talked to the, 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 um, the Washington State um, Department of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, and they helped me come up with a, uh, a plan to talk to the mod about doing that. And we got together and we did that. And it was just so awesome because now I can really enjoy this space and understand everything that's going on. And I can, you know, I can, I can have all my questions answered because I'm sure that the person that was down here was telling us all that. And I, no, no, nothing. And, and, and I, you know, I may have that obsession. My wife didn't. She's like, you know, I don't need to be sitting here translating everything for you the entire time while we're watching this. So that was sort of my motivation. I was going somewhere with this. <laughs> Lost my train of thought. So the one that one that won people's choice. Oh, that, thank you. The one that pe won people's choice is this right here, this beta fish. So I got. So uh, thank you. That's actually ah, Craig. So I'm sitting right up there, and there's a table, and there's a speaker right there. And I had my ear like in the speaker because I can't hear anything. And someone had I, stolen my hearing aids. So I didn't have any ability to hear. So Carrie was translating for me the whole time. And um, they're down here and they're making all these announcements and whatnot. And I got my ear to the, and they're like, oh, the People's Choice Awards, Eileen Legassi. And I looked at Carrie. She looks at me and she goes, that's you. <laughs> Even with my head there, I couldn't even hear it. It was like, it was, it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it happened. And then I didn't realize that it came with this residency. And so then Ben Cobb comes to me and he's like, congratulations. And I'm like stunned still, because I've been watching these guys blow glass for over a year now. They're like celebrities in my house. All these guys that I'm working with right now. And it was just, it, it was just unbelievable, unbelievable. So, um, and, and the best thing about it has been uh, signs. So it's been really great for me to be able to sign language, do sign language with him and have a conversation with him without having to struggle to be able to hear anything that anybody's saying and um, just feeling left out. Um, I, have to, um, I have to thank the people, um, the folks in the museum shop first and foremost because if it wasn't for them, Morgan, Susan, and Shane, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here right now and I wouldn't be able to do the thing that makes me so happy is to create beautiful things to make people happy. And if it wasn't for them and encouraging me and then just keep pushing me to do that, I wouldn't be here. The most important person I have to thank is my wife, who's been my support system, who doesn't question anything I want, all my crazy ideas, all my crazy ideas. She questions everything. I'm like, well, I can do it. I'm still going to do it. But she's like, all right, all right, go ahead, do it. And then the last person I want to thank is, um, he's my mentor. 
He's the guy that's been embracing my, gra my glass crazy. He's the fellow that's been working with me here on the floor, Tim. I also wouldn't be here without him. He has been a great support. He's been very patient. Well, sort of patient with me. I tend to be a little bit hyperactive. And I'm a blacksmith, so I'm a very aggressive artist. That's part of the deal. And glass is not aggressive. So he's trying to like dial me down, which he's now finding is a very difficult thing to do. Um, but you know, my life has ebbed and flowed as an artist and has changed and it has come to, and I'm just so happy that I've come to a place where I'm creating the things that have always wanted to do. Make these beautiful things and have the means to do it and have the support system to do it and be surrounded by the most talented and the most genuinely nice and generous people here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we couldn't be more grateful and more welcomed here since we moved here four years ago. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Eileen. Um, and I know I, I speak on behalf of the entire museum. You know, everything that you've shared with us today has been so inspiring. And having closed captioning behind me in the hot shop is a, is a huge leap forward for us. And, and it wouldn't have happened without your support. So thank you. Uh, we are going to do a quick uh, Q&A with Eileen. Uh, but before we do, I just want to um, mention that uh, it's not just the eight pieces that Eileen shared with us a year ago that are for sale in the museum store. We're honored to have some of her work available right now. So if you guys would like to go take a look uh, and see more of what Eileen's been up to, uh, you'll see it right in the front of the store uh, and Shane Morgan and Susan will be able to help you with any questions while you're in there. So congratulations. Uh, but I'm here uh, to help. If you have questions for Eileen, raise your hand and I'm gonna give the mic to Eileen uh, and help her here because it can be kind of hard from the top row. So uh, let me know if you have any questions and I'll give the mic back to you, Eileen. There's a partial one. Um, it's a partial picture. It goes all the way back here. My parents moved to Arizona in 1994, 93. Um, so we don't have this painting anymore, but this is part of it. So Calvin and Hobbes I made a big giant tree. There's a, there was a it was a big, it was our dartboard. We had a dartboard there. I had a big giraffe painted, and I had elephants, and I had, um, it was like a jungle scene with Calvin and Hobbes because I had a session with them as a kid. Oscar? You may not have a name. Oscar is sort of a special one. Um, so, I, my mother's brother, who has since passed away, was my favorite uncle. He was a hoarder. And I worked about three minutes down the road from him. And he was the tidiest hoarder I ever met. And I would go to tea with my aunt and uncle once a week, because it was just down the street. So I'd have tea with them. And every day, I would find a pile of crap in my back of my car. He would just say, oh, you can make stuff out of this. And he would just literally, I, while I was in having tea with my aunt, he would put it in my trunk, and I would find it the next day. So he had this, this uh, string of keys, not lying to you. It was longer than a yard, nested all together. And there must have been 3,000 of them there. So the reason why he has that is because my family is a very, if you haven't figured it out, very Muppets oriented since my brother is now with the Muppets and they're all educators. So um, that's sort of why he's not, he got a name and he's sort of a special piece for me. He is for sale. It's not cheap because I kept it there on purpose, but if you really want him, you can have him. Um, so he's really the only one I've given a name to. 
uh, unless I'm required to, like for example, the underwater disagreement, we gave that name to that because they require us to sort of give it a name when you apply for the, so I don't like putting names on any of my pieces only because then I don't want to get rid of them. You know, so if I put a name on it, it sort of becomes mine and then, then my house is full of sculptures and we have no room and then the cat knocks everything over. Sea turtles. Uh, my wife and I spell it, ce celebrated 10 years um, wedding anniversary. We went to Hawaii, and that's where my fascination came with that. So that was actually where it started. Um, and the jellyfish, um, that's the main source of food for sea turtles. So I thought they went hand in hand. There's not a lot to that. There's just that. <laughs> Eileen, how uh, can people find out more about your work? My website is sorely behind, so Instagram is the best way to find me, Quench Bucket Studio. It's right up there on the screen. You can find me on Facebook, on Instagram, and I actually have some videos of how I made a few of my pieces on YouTube, if you can find that, all under the guise of Quench Bucket Studio. So anywhere, on, you can go to my website, you can see all the other stuff I've made. It's just not a place to buy something. So if you want to DM, DM me on my Instagram, I can do commission pieces if you're interested. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, please join me in giving her a round of applause. <laughs> Okay, we're going to take a short lunch break, uh, but we'll be back and working again in about 20 minutes at 2 o'clock. So uh, please enjoy the galleries, uh, and I'll be here if you guys have any questions as you're on the way out. Thank you, and thank you again, Eileen.
Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Museum of Glass. Today we have a guest artist, Eileen Lagasse, and uh, she's, we're gonna meet, she's gonna be making some sculptures similar to the ones that you see on the pedestal and on that table. She's working with our Museum of Glass Hot Shop team. So the folks on the, on the floor that you see handling the glass, they are the museum glass blowers. And when we have a guest artist like Eileen, uh, she make, comes up with designs and uh, our team will execute her designs. Can we put up some of her work up on the big screen? So if you look up on the big screen, you can see some of her sculptures. She's a metal worker, a blacksmith, she's a painter, and her most recent work is combining the steel with the glass. So there's our artist right now, holding the flowers. Let's have a little hand for Eileen Lagasse. There you go. So I'm guessing that some of you have not been here before. Am I right? So let's just, uh, before we get into our, what they're making, we'll just give you a very quick introduction to how glass blowing works. Everything that we do starts out in our glass furnaces. The glass furnaces are the machines where you see the doors closed. If you look up on the big screen, you'll see a diagram. That's what they look like inside. So inside each one is a big ceramic pot. In that ceramic pot is a thousand pounds of melted glass. We keep the melted glass at 2100 degrees. And at that temperature, the glass has the consistency of honey. So if you can imagine a giant crock pot full of honey, that's what our furnace is like. When we want to get it out to make stuff, we take one of those steel pipes. Those are called blow pipes and we dip it into the melted glass like you're dipping into a big jar of, of honey. We dip it in, twirl it around, a little bit of glass sticks to the end of the pipe. The pipe itself is hollow, so when you blow, the ball of glass blows up like a balloon. If you wanna make something larger, we dip it in, blow a little bubble, let it harden, and then we dip it in a second time or a third time. We just keep building up the glass in layers. Once you get the glass out of the furnace, it only stays soft for a little while. So we do whatever shaping or blowing we can while it's hot and soft. And when it starts to cool and get stiff, we go to the second type of furnace. The second type is called the glory hole. The glory holes are the round ones with the doors open. Those have no glass in them. They're just a hot chamber for heating and softening the glass while we're working. All the glass that's in those furnaces is clear glass. It has no color. We buy our colored glass in various forms, and then we coat our clear glass with the colored glass. We buy it in bars, we buy it in chips, we buy it in powders. So we're gonna use a mix of these bars, they're called color bar, and uh, little chips which are called frit, F-R-I-T. Can we put the frit photo up? So we just put the, the little chips of colored glass in a bowl, we take the clear glass out of the furnace, we roll it in the little chips, they stick to the surface, we put it in the fire, they melt, and they form a candy coating of color like an M&M, with the colored parts on the outside. So that's basically it, that's glass bar. Anybody have any questions so far?
Yes, sir. Get clogged? Why does the tube get clogged? I don't know what it would get clogged with. You're just blowing air in there. The glass is on the end of the tube. You blow in this end. So the air goes in and it blow inflates the glass like you inflate a balloon. How many in the team? Let's see. Ben, who's sitting at the bench. Ben Cobb. He's 29 years of glass blowing. Uh, Gabe, in the light gray shirt, 26. And uh, Sarah, who's over on the left, I think she's about 23 years. So they're all very uh, experienced uh, glass blowers. So the first thing we're going to do is called stuffing a color cup. We want to put a layer of colored glass on the outside of our object. Can we put up stuffing a color cup? So if you look up in the big screen, we have a drawing. Sarah, over on the left, has the color cup. Ben, on the right, just to right of center, He's getting the glass to go inside. So we'll put the color cup on a little metal stand. Ben will come over with his bubble, and we'll fill that cup up with uh, clear glass. All glass, when it's really hot, looks orange. The orange color that you're seeing is the glow from the heat. The glass that Ben is working at the center bench is completely clear. But of course, you're seeing orange, and that's the glow from the heat. So ben is going into the cup. If you can't see it from where you're sitting, look at the uh, big screen. We have a nice shot there. Chris, our video guy, is very talented. He gets all the action. If there's anything going on while during this process and you can't really see it clearly from where you're sitting, look up on the big screen. We'll try to have everything crucial up on the big screen. The hot glass sticks to hot steel. I'm not sure exactly what the physics are, but it sticks to hot steel, doesn't stick to cold steel. We roll it on the table, it doesn't stick because the table's cold. I think it has to do with uh, the, the 
molecules being more mobile when it's hot so they can get attracted to each other, but something like that. You have to find a real physicist to explain that. So now we've kind of welded the two together and we start to blow it up. This bubble is going to become the body of the turtle. We're going to blow it inside another one of these metal frames. Oh, that's going to be the fins? Okay, oh, I was wrong. Uh, this, we're going to use this mask to make the fins, not the body of the turtle. We're cutting off a section. 
And we'll separate this into separate sections. And we'll use these separate sections to make the fins. Has anybody got any questions? Yeah. The table? Oh, can we put a, a, a camera on the pipe cooler? Just for a minute? So that's called the pipe cooler. It's a little steel trough. We lay the metal pipes in the trough, and then we spray water on it, and that cools the pipe down and makes it easier to hold. So if the pipe gets too hot, we go over to the pipe cooler. Does that make sense? Look at the big screen right now. You can see we're spraying water on the metal pipe. You guys have any So now in the center, Ben is shaping the glass with a pad of folded up wet newspaper, ordinary newspaper. As long as the newspaper is wet, the paper doesn't burn too much, and it doesn't leave any marks as we shape the glass. Can we put up the newspaper photo? So it's just regular newspaper like you'd have at your house. So we're cutting up this mass of glass that we colored into four separate sections. Each section we'll use to make one of the flippers.
So at this point, we have both benches going, making the flippers of our turtle. As we make each of these smaller parts, we're going to place them in an oven called the garage. That's this oven right here. It operates at half the temperature of the furnaces. It's hot enough to keep the glass from breaking, but it's not hot enough to make it soft. So whatever goes in the garage stays warm, holds its shape. We're ready to use it. We pull it out, heat it up a little extra. So make all these little parts, store them in the garage. We'll make the body of the turtle, and then we'll pull the parts out one by one and stick them on. So over on this bench on the, your left, Eileen, our guest artist, and Tim are constructing one of the flippers. If you look up on the big screen, we have a camera on Eileen. We heat the, the glass up in the glory hole, the round furnace, make it soft, and then we'll bring it back to Eileen at the bench, and she'll do some shape.
Over on the left, you can see Eileen has taken the steel frame that she created, which is going to be the body of the turtle, and she's checking the proportions versus the flipper that she's sculpted.
had our own shop and brought all the frames here and now we're making the glass. In the center, Ben is making one of the front flippers. Over on the far bench, they're making the rear flipper. Yes. The texture. Oh, that's not sand. Those are little chips of colored glass called frit, and we're melting it in uh, s to get color. So we want a light color on the underside of the flipper and a darker color on the outside. So they take the, the glass for the flipper and press it on that frit, that crushed glass, some of it sticks, and that gives us the color of the underside. Invited her, got rid of the shop, get used to the, the uh, equipment. And um, so the purpose of the studio is so that visitors can see all different kinds of glassmaking, different artist approaches, different techniques. So we, we bring in a lot of people from outside to, you know, show you different kinds yeah. of things. And, um, stuff for the store yeah. to sell, but, um, well, yeah, I mean, well, we have about 30 guest artists for over a, week, a year, wow. that's sort of 20 weeks of something else and 30 weeks of guest artists, and it comes from all over the world, uh, she's from Olympia, but they come from Italy, Japan, Sweden. France, Italy, Murano. Murano is the glass one. Murano is the lace one.
demonstrations yeah. where kind of set up for this project. Has anybody got any questions? Can we put up some of Eileen's work up on the big screen? So Eileen Lagasse is our guest artist. She's here as our guest artist for five days. She's working with our Museum of Glass Hot Shop team. And we're mainly making these sculptures where she constructs a, uh, a framework out of recycled uh, silverware and we're blowing the glass elements to go into those frames. So right now we're making a sea turtle. We're working on all the exterior parts, the, the flippers and the head. As we finish each one, it'll go into the garage. The garage is this oven over here. We'll keep it warm, then we'll blow the body, and then we'll stick on all the external parts. Over on this bench, Eileen Lugasi is shaping what will be the rear fin of the turtle.
So here at the museum, we do a lot of different things. We have guest artists, like we do today. We, have, we do commissions. One of our favorite things to do here at the museum is a contest for kids called Kids Design Glass. Any kid that comes to the museum, 12 and under, can do a drawing. Once a month, we pick one of the drawings and we make whatever the kid drew out of glass. We make two copies one for the kid to take home, and one for the museum collection. It's free to enter. There's a table out in the lobby with entry forms and stuff to draw with. And if your kid doesn't want to draw right now, you can grab an entry form, do the drawing at home, and mail it in. We have a little video. We can show you some of the things we've done with the kids in the past. We play kids design. <laughs> it's a baby monster. Pip is a baby monster that loves to smile and laugh. Even though he's little and cute, he gives a big cry. Also, Pip loves food, especially bananas. He will eat any speck of food in sight. just somebody else that, you know, they did it, you know, and I couldn't do that. Absolutely not. Anyone can do this. It's, and I think that's what it shows the kids. Maybe not everybody can. But, <laughs> and that, and that. I think it's going to be, it's going to stand up there with one of the coolest things that, that a museum has ever done. What is it, a, a, cucum a cucumber all dressed up for a night on the town? I, that's, that's pretty ridiculously funny. The funnest part about this project is how fresh the ideas are coming from the kids who they, they have no idea of glass blowing techniques, they don't care. Nobody saw this coming. We'd make one piece and it was given to the family. And then we realized, well, wait a second, there's something more here. We started to get more drawings, more interesting drawings, and it really kind of snowballed a little bit. Bacon Boy was special.
shows that you know there's an artist in, in all of us. I think so. And it's a uh, it's human nature to be creative. And so I think we lose that as we get older sometimes. And it's cool to see this pure um, creative nature that that children possess. So I think it's cool to to share that with the rest of the world. Hopefully. So. Thank you for supporting Kids Design Glass. <laughs> so if you're here with kids, we highly encourage you to enter the contest. Remember, 12 and or younger. So as Ben, sitting at the center, puts the finishing touches on one of the front flippers, Gabe, in the light gray shirt, is going to start the bubble that's eventually going to become the body of the turtle. So Ben is going over, Ben, tall guy in great black shirt, is going over to the garage, the silver oven on the side of the studio. And he's put that flipper in the garage. It'll stay warm. We're ready to attach it. We'll heat it up again a little extra. Yes. So let's, well, we started, I think, at uh, 10 after 2. We're about an hour into it. I'd say we have almost another hour. I have no idea.
guys. Good. You guys have any questions? He's making the bubble. We're making a, a turtle sculpture like you see on the far pedestal. And this bubble is going to be the body of the turtle. Our guest artist has made some steel frames. You can see one on the jellyfish. And we're going to blow the bubble into that steel frame. And then we're going to attach all the flippers and the head. There's two kinds of ovens. There's the glass furnaces that hold the tanks of molten glass. Those are 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. The glory holes, the round ones with the doors open, those run at 2,300. So, 2,100 is as hot as the hottest volcano. So the glory, the glory hole is hotter than the hottest volcano, just by a little bit. Do you have a question? Somebody uh, have a question? Ben said somebody had a question. did this morning was two and a half hours. So I'm thinking sometime we'll be finished probably around 4.30, maybe a little later. This is a labor intensive project.
So over on the bench on the far left, Ben is shaping the bubble that's going to become the body of our sea turtle. So we've made a special design, a kind of jigsaw puzzle of glass pieces. It's been w w warming up in that oven. And that's going to give us the pattern for the turtle's back. We cast individual hexagons of different colors and different designs. And now we placed it on that ceramic plate. We're going to heat that up and melt it onto the bubble that Ben has. So that pattern will be on the back of the, end up on the back of the turtle, and we'll have a, a light-colored pattern on the front. Ben is shaping the glass. Ben on the far left. He's shaping the glass bubble to be the proper shape to pick up our pattern. In the center section, Gabe and Sarah are heating up the pattern, giving a little bit of a squeeze so that all the individual tiles stick together. Ben is making the bubble that will receive the pattern. Ben's measuring his bubble. So we're going to roll Ben's bubble over the flat pattern. The pattern will stick to his bubble and he'll melt it in. Get a picture of the pattern. Can you get a close up, maybe? You're getting a little bit of a side view, but you see that pattern? It's made up of uh, hexagonal pieces of glass, some kind of whitish ones, and some kind of amber ones. The amber section will end up being the back of the turtle. The whitish ones will be the underbelly.
So Gabe has two metal paddles, and he's squeezing the glass. Right now, the glass is kind of soft and kind of sticky. The trick here is to heat it up enough so we can get all the tiles to stick together, but not so much that it sticks to the ceramic plate below. It's kind of an uh, art. Doesn't always work, but these guys are pretty good. You guys have any questions? Can we put up picking Marini on a bubble, picking up Marini on a bubble? This is not quite exactly the same, but it's pretty close. So we're going to have our pattern on the ceramic shelf. We're going to roll the hot bubble over it, and the pattern will adhere to the bubble, and then we'll melt it in. Heat that pattern up in the big round oven, the glory hole. The edges kind of get hot first, and the center doesn't get as hot. So sometimes when we come out, you'll see them take a torch and warm up the center to compensate. Here comes Ben with the bubble. We're going to brush off any of the release. We paint those ceramic shells with the release made of clay-rich mud. And you'll see him take a little whisk broom and whisk it off so it doesn't end up embedded in the glass.
So right now, we're trying to melt in that pattern. And then we're going to shape the bubble to go into our frame that uh, Eileen, our guest artist, built. We're going to trim a little bit of glass off the end. Those tongues are called the jacks. He's giving it a squeeze as his assistant turns the pipe. And we're going to cut that little knob off. Has anybody got any questions? Those of you that have been here for a while, thank you for sticking with us. I know it's a long process. So now Ben is squeezing the glass and making a sharp crease in it. That crease is the place where we can break the glass away from the metal pipe once we're done shaping. He's going to pre-shape the bubble before we go into the mold. blow into a mold. We want to shape the bubble so to be approximately like the mold so that when it expands, it expands as evenly as possible. So we just don't go into the mold with any random shape. We kind of pre-shape it so that it expands as uniformly as possible. All these uh, frames that you see that we're blowing into, they were all created by Eileen in her own studio before this, uh, before this residency even began. So she had all that metal work finished, and she's come here to do the glass part. If you look closely at the frames, you notice that they're made from recycled silverware, uh, stainless steel, but I don't know what other term you would call it, knives, forks, and spoons, and, and such. So they look pretty elegant, but if you look, if you really look, you can see how they were formed out of spoons and forks 
and things like that. So if you look in the center, just in front of the stairs, that's Tim. He's getting ready to hold the metal frame while we blow into it. Ben is checking the diameter so that bubble will slip through the opening. Ben's going to get that bubble really hot and soft. He's going to walk up those steps and drop the bubble into the framework. Here we go. If you can't see it from where you're sitting, look up at the big screen. We have a nice shot with the camera. So Ben's going to blow hard. Get that bubble to fill out that mold. Blowing air where we want to cool the bubble down, make it a little stiffer. Eileen's checking out how she feels about how it blew out in the mold.
Glass is made of three basic ingredients, sand, soda ash, and lime. Sand is the bulk of it. It's mostly melted sand. Soda ash is sodium carbonate. It's a chemical which lowers the melting temperature of the sand, and lime is calcium carbonate, and that stabilizes the mixture chemically. Um, we cook it at 2,400 degrees, so pretty hot. The colors in glass come mostly from metals dissolved in the glass when you first cook it up. So if you take those three ingredients, sand, soda, ash, and lime, you cook them up with cobalt, you get blue. Chromium, you get green. Tin, you get white. Not everything that colors glass is a metal, but most of the colorants are. If you're interested in uh, Eileen's work, there are some examples for sale in our gift shop across the lobby. Rumor has it that they're very reasonably priced. We've got to finish this thing, then we've got to start attaching all the, the flippers. Yeah, then we've got to transfer it, put the head on. Yeah, we've got a, a, a lot of work to go. Okay, yeah, we can come in and out. They blew it. The metal frames have an opening at the top. We dropped a bubble inside and blew it up to fill the frame. Yep. Steve, the, the temperature of the furnace is Steve to the temperature of the melting point of the steel chimney. No. Glass stainless steel melts roughly around 27, 2800. So when we attach these uh, pieces to the body, we have to heat two things. We have to heat the edge of the piece itself. We also have to heat the spot where we're going to attach it. So we get the two edges hot, we press them together, they stick.
enjoying yourself? Oh yeah? Then there was a little kid? Friends around that show. In fact, no, no. Uh, did you know the judge, Kathleen Gray? Who's the judge on the show? The tall, thin lady. Oh, okay. She was here yesterday. got a little short tail. It's all stainless. It's all old stainless um, tableware, okay. like like forks and spoons, and, um, and she just she welds it in a way that it's it's all um, sort of triangulated. It's got nowhere to go. Gabe in a light gray shirt has another flipper. He's got on that tray. Ben, tall guy in the black shirt, will pick it up. Heat up the edge, heat up the spot where we're sticking it. And we press the two together and they fuse. Anybody got any questions? Over on the right, Gabe is going to make the punty.
P-U-N-T-Y. This rod is going to act as a temporary handle to hold the turtle while we, uh, we attach stuff on the opposite side. He's going to make a special kind of punty. It's called a two-prong punty. It has two arms, and it'll attach to the turtle in two places. This is not part of the object. We're going to cut it away at the end. It's just there to temporarily hold it while we work on the opposite side. You see, Gabe has spun out two independent arms. He's going to pull them forward a little bit. And we're going to use that. We're going to attach that to the belly of the sea turtle. So Gabe is going to let that punty stiffen a bit. And then we're going to coat the very tips with some molten glass. The molten glass will make the tips hot and sticky. But the main structure of the punty will be firm. So we're attaching the punty. Take the shears and crimp the attachments so we have a place to break it off.
we finally break it off, we'll crack the glass where those uh, crimps are. There'll still be a little bit of clear glass left on the sculpture. And when the sculpture is cold, we'll mechanically grind that off and polish it. We're going to clean up the opening where the head is going to go. Looks like what? Oh, yeah. Way to make them hear those teeth. Thanks for coming in, guys.
Hi, how are you guys? Good. Do you guys have any questions? Any? Well, the glass only s when you heat it up, it only stays soft for a little while. It's like wax. When you get wax hot, it gets soft, but fairly quickly it gets stiff again. So we heat it up. We do whatever shaping we can while it's hot and soft. And as it starts to stiffen again, we go back and heat it up some more. Right. Well, no, no, no. We, when we, we first made the body of the turtle, we blew a bubble. We broke the end of the bubble off, and there was a little hole. So the first the bit of order of business was to close up that hole, and then we're going to stick the head on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. So they're basically cleaning it up, getting it ready to, res to receive the head. The head was sculpted earlier in the day. I think it was sitting warm in that oven. I think Sarah just pulled it out. What? Uh, these things are about two and a half, three hours of the glass blowing part, and then anywhere from an hour to six hours to make the metal uh, framework. And that happened. Uh, Eileen did all that work at her own studio before coming here. So we had all, all the frameworks were all done. And now we're doing the glass part, which is roughly two and a half to three hours. Yes. Well, there's two types of kilns. There's the glass furnaces where we keep the molten glass. Those are 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. And the glory holes, the round ones with the doors open, those are 2,300. Does that answer your question? What, how was the torches? The big, what we call the fluffy torch, the one with the bigger flame, that's 3,500 degrees. The small blue-white flame is about 5,000 degrees. That's a propane and oxygen torch. So it's all pretty hot. Now we're going to make sure, uh, let's see what he's going to do.
then wants to make a little adjustment in the metal. Um, no, probably not. But uh, when we have a guest artist, they take home everything they make except for two pieces, one which will go in our annual auction and one which will be in our collection. But everything else they take home and do with what they want. But I'm sure if you're interested, we could hook you up. See, um, Eileen is our guest. She brought Tim with her, and uh, Gabe in the gray shirt, Ben in the tall guy in black shirt, and Sarah are our museum of glass employees, and Carly standing by the, to the right of the. Uh, Carly's our intern. Uh, ben has been doing it for 29 years, uh, Gabe 26, and what? You can eventually, but uh, yeah, these guys, these guys are consummate professionals. They've been doing it for quite a while. And Sarah's, I think, 23. It makes them look young. Look, you see, look at those guys. They, they don't look like they've been doing it for 29 years. Actually, it's clean living and pure thoughts that keep them so young. I think we're just about one flipper away from paradise.
Sierra is heating up the last flipper. We made it earlier this afternoon. It's been sitting in the garage, staying warm. Now it's close to time to attach it. What? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm guessing. I'm guessing it's probably 25, 30 pounds. But it's 25, 30 pounds at the end of a pole. So it's like picking up a bowling ball with a fish, fishing, <coughs> fishing pole. Excuse me. So it feels a lot heavier than it actually is. comes Sarah with the last flipper. The fin, I don't know what you call them.
Everything that we make has to be cooled slowly or it'll break. So we're going to take it off the metal rod. We're going to place it in an oven called the annealer where it'll be cooled slowly overnight. Each day we heat up the annealer to 890 degrees Fahrenheit. We place all the objects we make during the day in there. And then at night, it has a computerized thermostat that slowly turns the temperature down to room temperature. If we didn't cool it slowly, the glass would break. Sarah has put on some protective clothing. The gloves she's wearing are made out of Kevlar. Kevlar is a fire-resistant insulating material. When she grabs that turtle, it'll be about 1,000 degrees. At that temperature, the glass will be hard. And we'll take it to our annealer, where it will cool slowly overnight. When we're ready to remove it from the metal rod, we'll take a pair of tweezers, dip them in water. We'll drip some water where we want the glass to crack. A little tap on the pipe, and off it comes. Before we put it away, we want to make the temperature as even as possible, between the thick parts and the thin parts. When we remove it, the glass will be hard already, and hopefully won't move or shape or bend. Here we go. We drip some water on the joints of the punty, just below the little knobs. The water will crack those joints. Give the pipe a tap. Off it comes. And into our annealer. So let's have a big hand for Eileen and the Museum of Glass Hot Shop team. Yes. Yes. Oh, they did it manually. The the ovens ran on wood, so after they finished the work day, they'd throw in a little less wood. They'd open a vent, and you know, after a while, you get to know your kiln. It ha it doesn't have to be done precisely. 
but it's got to be done slowly. So that's the important part. up to 5 o'clock. We're going to blow one more thing. I think we're going to make what they call the hood of the jellyfish, that would be this part right here.
grate out some cane on that metal plate. Cane or rods of colored glass. We're going to take the bubble that Gabe has. Gabe is a man with a light gray shirt. We're going to roll it over those canes. They'll stick to the surface and become striped. So we're pretty near the end of the working day. We're going to make one more part, and that will be the hood of one of these jellyfishes. We won't be able to complete the entire jellyfish. We don't have time, but we will make the hood and blow it into the metal framework. As we roll the bubble over the canes, they stick to the surface. When we melt them in, they'll be stripes. Has anybody got any questions?
to Eileen's taking the torch and a stick of colored glass and melting in some detail. Getting ready to blow into the framework. The framework was constructed by our guest artist, Eileen Legassi. Legassi. Then in the center, it's heating up the bubble, making it nice and soft. We'll drop it inside the framework and blow. Anybody got any questions? guys have any questions?
We're checking the diameter. I think Ben's going to heat the glass up, make it nice and soft, hand it over to Eileen, and Eileen's going to blow it into the metal framework. Here we go. is cooling off the side so it doesn't blow too much. So we're going to transfer the glass from the rod it was originally blown on to a second steel rod called the punty. The second steel rod will hold it from the top while we shape the bottom. 